Good morning, and happy Fourth Sunday of Advent. We welcome you to St. Andrew's Episcopal Church in Methuen, Massachusetts, on this cold, cold day. We will now, uh, in just a moment, start the um, lighting of the Advent wreath, but we welcome you, whoever you are, wherever you are in your journey of faith. God's blessing on you. The Lord be with you. And us with you. Let us pray together. Purify our conscience, Almighty God, by your daily visitation, that your Son, Jesus Christ, at his coming, may find in us a mansion prepared for himself, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. A reading from the second book of Samuel. When the king was settled in his house, and the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies around him, the king said to the prophet Nathan, See now, I am living in a house of cedar. But the ark of God stays in the tent. Nathan says to the king, Go, do all that you have in mind, for the Lord is with you. But that same night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan, Go and tell my servant David, Thus says the Lord, Are you the one to build me a house to live in? I have not lived in a house since the day that I brought up the people of Israel from Egypt to this day. But I have been moving about in a tent and a tabernacle. Wherever I have moved about among all the people of Israel, did I ever speak a word with any of the tribal leaders of Israel, whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, saying, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? 
Now, therefore, thus you shall say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, to be prince over the people, my people Israel. And I have been with you wherever you went, and have cut off all your enemies from before you. And I will make for you a great name, like the name of the great ones of the earth. And I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and will plant them, so that they may live in their own place, and be disturbed no more. And evildoers shall inflict them no more, as formerly, from the time that I appointed judges over my people Israel. And I will give you rest from all your enemies. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. Your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. This morning's time is taken from Psalm 89. We will read responsibly, breaking at the half verse. Your love, O Lord, forever will I sing. From age to age, my mouth will proclaim your faithfulness. For I am persuaded that your love is established forever. You have set your faithfulness firmly in the heavens. I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn an oath to David, my servant. I will establish your line forever and preserve your throne for all generations. You spoke once in a vision and said to your faithful people, I have set the crown upon a warrior and have exalted one chosen out of the people. I have found David, my servant. With my holy oil, I have anointed him. My hand will hold him fast and my arm will make him strong. No enemy shall deceive him, nor any wicked man bring him down. I will crush his foes before him, and strike down those who hate him. My faithfulness and love shall be with him, and he shall be victorious through my name. I shall make his dominion extend, from the great sea to the river. He will say to me, you are my father. My God and the rock of my salvation. A reading from the letter to the Romans. Now to God who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the proclamation of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages, but is now disclosed, and through the prophetic writings is made known to all the Gentiles, according to the command of the eternal God, to bring about the obedience of faith, to the only wise God, through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever. Amen. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Luke. Glory to you, Lord Christ. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary, and he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be holy. He will be called Son of God. And now your relative Elizabeth in her old age, has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month for her who was said to be barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise you, Lord Christ. Lord Christ. In the name of our all-living, all-loving God, Creator, Christ, and Spirit. Amen. Amen. Well, on one Christmas Eve back in, I guess it was the mid-60s, my home church, St. Anne's Episcopal Church in Northwest Atlanta, was using readings that were contemporary translations instead of the traditional King James reading. We were all going through trial use liturgy. Some of you will remember those rather chaotic times. I'll never forget my very traditionalist father who read the King James Version all the time. He came home from church and announced with shock and horror, he said, well, I've heard it all now. And I said, what have you heard? He said, Mary is no longer great with child. I said, no. Well, tell me, that, what is it? He said, now Mary is obviously pregnant. <laughs> I have some sympathy for my father in his desire for a beautiful language to bespeak a beautiful story. But the deeper issue here, of course, is not how we talk about Mary's pregnancy, how she looked, but how we understand the nature of the child she is bearing, and what that means for us. Today's gospel reading, it's the Annunciation, is celebrated by the church. You can come to church every March 25th, nine months right before Christmas, and it puts before us an essential issue of our faith, which is this. When did God get involved in the life of Jesus of Nazareth? When did God get involved in Jesus' life? In the first centuries, after the crucifixion and resurrection, the early Christians were, were just trying to reprogram all sorts of things that had happened to them and to make sense of them. 
And there were competing answers to that question. One group said God didn't get involved uh, with Jesus until his baptism. They said at his baptism, that's when God adopted Jesus as God's son. And this view, appropriately enough, is called adoptionism. God adopts Jesus as his son at the Jordan River when he's getting baptized in the whole scene of the Spirit and claiming and saying, you know, you are my beloved son. With you I am well pleased. They're saying that's where God gets involved with Jesus. Therefore, for the adoptionists, there's no need to have Christmas or get into all these stories about Mary and Joseph and angels. No need at all. You could do like Mark's gospel does, start when Jesus is a grown man. And let's be honest, this view has always had a strong appeal to those of us, most of us, I assume, who grew up seeing life through the eyes of a rationalistic enlightenment, in which God is far off in heaven somewhere, uninvolved with life on this planet. There's no room for mystery and the power of God to do anything. Doesn't, if it doesn't fit the worldview I can conjure up with my five senses, then it can never happen. And therefore, I'm not going to believe it. It's okay to let the kids have their Christmas pageant because they'll outgrow it soon enough. On the opposite end of the adoptionism spectrum, however, is the view we get in today's gospel reading. A young teen, they think maybe she's 13, 14 years old, named Mary, gets a visitation from the angel Gabriel, who says, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. He says, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. For the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the Lord God will will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be holy, and he will be called Son of God. On the Sunday after Christmas, we will read the Gospel of John's account of the same story, but in very different, dare I say, in philosophical language. You know it. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. In John's view, from before time, right, but from before creation, from before there's anything like time, God plans to come among us through Jesus, and therefore there's never been a time that God isn't involved in all of creation, and especially in the conception, life, death, and resurrection of this Jew from Nazareth named Jesus. And therefore, we would call him Emmanuel, God with us. The same story Luke is telling. The word of God speaks creation into existence in Genesis, and the word of God speaks Jesus into existence in the gospel. So when did God get involved in the life of Jesus of Nazareth? From before time and forever. Because God loves us and actively works inside creation to bring us into the full awareness of our union with God inside, inside the divine love. That's God's intention from before time. If you have no problem believing God speaks creation into existence like at the Big Bang, there's no logical reason God couldn't speak Jesus into existence. But to get distracted over by the issue of how God is involved in the conception of Jesus is to miss the deeper point being made. Now Luke and John, and of course Matthew, tell the story of Jesus' origin in different ways, they agree that Mary's child is not the result 
of our random colliding of atoms and molecules and cells, but the result of the loving intention of God. And while surely we cannot fully comprehend this mystery, we can't comprehend even the mystery of our own lives, we can love this mystery. And so we do. And that's why at this season we are in love with what God has done in Christ. And unfortunately, we, uh, in other times, we would be in this church celebrating that love. It just wants to pour out of us. But we do what we can. So we decorate our home and we light our candles that may pierce the darkness of our lives, celebrating the loving intention and attention of God in sending Jesus among us. Unfortunately, too often Christians stop there. Okay, here it is. God has been involved in you know, birth, life, death, of Jesus, resurrection of Jesus, and that's the end of the story. And therefore we miss the stunning fact that this mystery includes not just creation, not just incarnation, but it also includes the mystery of of our union with God in Christ. Beloved, we are all part of this story. In the Eastern uh, Orthodox Church, Greek Orthodox, Russian Orthodox, that great, vast, uh, wonderful communion of faith, this union is called theosis. Theo, obviously theos being the Greek word for God. Theosis, in which our finite humanity is fully joined with infinite God. That's how you and I are part of this mystery. That's what Christ came to do, to awaken us to that mystery of us inside the love of God. As St. Cyril of Alexandria in the 5th century said, we are made partakers of the divine nature and are said to be sons and daughters of God, not only, not only because we are exalted by grace to supernatural glory, but also because we had God dwelling in us. This is the part of the mystery of Annunciation and Incarnation we must not ignore. Notice how John's gospel described your salvation and mine. A little further down in prologue, I just read some of the prologue to you, but this, you'll recognize this. This is what John says, quote, But to all who received the word, who believed in his name, God gave power to become children of God who were born not of blood, or of the will of the flesh, or of the will of man, but born of God. Do you see it? Do you see it? We, like Jesus, quote, are born not of the blood, or of the will of the flesh, or of the will of man. We are born of God. This is your truest nature and deepest self. God is your father, mother. My father and mother are not just John and Polly Bradbury, God rest their souls, but father, mother, God. This is why in Genesis it says human beings are born in the image and likeness of God. Just like we say sometimes, we go see a baby, oh, he's a spitting image of his father. Oh, she's a spitting image of her mother. We're spitting images of God. But I know, of course, we don't believe this. We, our, our mortal mind simply doesn't believe this. We, we ignore it. It's hard enough believing it about Jesus. I mean, how are we going to believe it about ourselves? But, so what we do is, well, I'll explore my genealogy. My wife, she spent hours doing that, much to the, which has helped our family learn a great many things. And we can, 
even now do what we did, you know, send our DNA off, find out what countries we have living in us. I got England, Scotland, Wales, a little northern Europe in me. Pretty boring, actually. But the reality is that we go back further than our DNA, all the way back to the loving intention and attention of God. As a friend of mine said years ago in uh, very colloquial terms, God's joy, God's joy is not complete until our rear end is sitting in the lap of the Father. God's joy is not complete until you are sitting in the lap of the Father as God's beloved son or daughter. Jesus is not Superman from the planet Krypton with superhuman powers. Jesus is son of God, son of man, son of Mary sent by the loving intention of God to bring us into his experience of God, what he calls the realm of God, so we too might wake up and know our true nature in God. And not just our true nature, but the true nature of every human being on the planet. They're all our brothers and sisters in God. As Richard Rohr, Father Richard Rohr, Franciscan priest and teacher, puts it, we believe this story in Jesus so that finally we may believe it about ourselves. And it's what the Apostle Paul means when he says, I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. What do we do with this kind of news? How, how do we absorb it? How do we react to it? Well, of course, Mary is our primary teacher here. She's our example of how to respond to this profound mystery. She says, here I am, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. For Mary was not just obviously pregnant or great with child. Mary is part of God's eternal plan for the salvation, the theosis, of us all in Christ. Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. And his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray. Father, we pray for your holy Catholic 
church. That, that we, we all be may be one. Grant that every member of the church may truly and humbly serve you. That, that your name may be glorified by all people. In the diocesan cycle of prayer, we pray for the parishes of the Alwine Deanery, Episcopal Chaplaincy at Harvard, Cambridge, the Lutheran Episcopal Chaplaincy at Massachusetts Institute of Technology, Cambridge, the Society of St. John the Evangelist, Cambridge, hospital chaplaincies and healthcare chaplains. In the Anglican cycle of prayer, we pray for mission agencies and their ministry throughout the Anglican communion, including the Mother's Union around the world. And we pray for our friends at St. John's in Lumley, Tanzania. In the local cycle of prayer, we pray for St. Monica's Church, Methuen Mass. We pray for all bishops, priests, and deacons that they, they may be faithful ministers of your word and sacraments. We pray for all who govern and hold authority in the nations of the world, that, that there may be justice and peace on the earth. Give us grace to do your will in all that we undertake, that, that our works may find favor in your sight. We pray for those on our parish prayer list, Christopher Juris, Katie Dobson, Anne Duffy, Chris and Doreen Hutchins, Tony Montecarlo, Howard Dearden, Jack and family, Sean Broder, Dot Johnson, Kelly Tinch Hansen, Ralph Carey, Ellen Weinhold, Kimberly Barker, Blanche Campbell, Christopher Brennan and Janet Cavallos Brennan, and Edison Monday, and James Senegal from the from the Gumbi. Give them courage and hope in their troubles and bring them the joy of your salvation. Have compassion on those who suffer from any grief or trouble. That they may be delivered from their distress. The altar today is prepared in loving memory of Len Brown. Give to the departed eternal rest. Let light perpetual shine upon them. We praise you for your saints who have entered into joy. May we also come to share in your heavenly kingdom. Let us pray for our own needs and those of others. Heavenly Father, in you we live and move and have our being. We humbly pray you so to guide and govern us by your Holy Spirit, that in all the cares and occupations of our life we may not forget you, but may remember that we are ever walking in your loving sight through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins to our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also, and also with you. you. Peace. 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 Uh, just several announcements. Again, welcome. Our Christmas Eve 
services. We'll be having carols at 6.15, and then the live stream will begin at 6.30 Christmas Eve. Uh, just some announcements from Krista's email. Check out your pledge info. There's a, Jim Deegan has an, uh, something there. The book group will meet today for our fourth uh, Sunday, uh, Zooming at 11. You can find the link in Krista's email. Thank you to Bev Brown for uh, the Adopt a Child program and all um, you and all others have helped with man and the food pantry. And we thank our altar guild and our musicians and readers and Krista as our guest producer today. <laughs> and thank all who were involved in hosting and who attended our park parking lot Carol sing along this past Sunday evening. It was great fun, uh, and it was um, it was a wonderful time to be together, even though we were separate. Oh, and one last announcement I just got: a friend is offering fresh Christmas trees to families in need. If you would like one, contact Laura Walter. Walter, walk in love as Christ loved us and gave Himself for us an offering and sacrifice to God. to give him thanks and praise. It is right to the good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, because you sent your beloved Son to redeem us from sin and death and make us heirs in him of everlasting life, that when he shall come again in power and great triumph to judge the world, we may, without shame or fear, rejoice to behold his appearing. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and dark angels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, 
God of power and might. Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. We give thanks to you, O God, for the goodness and love which you have made known to us in creation in the calling of Israel to be your people, in your words spoken through the prophets, and above all, in the word made flesh, Jesus, your Son. For in these last days you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In him you have delivered us from evil, and made us worthy to stand before you. In him you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night before he died for us, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it, and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took a cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, according to his command, O Father, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection, we await his coming in glory, and we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your Son in his sacrifice, that we may be acceptable through him, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ, and bring us to that heavenly country where with St. Andrew and all your saints, we may enter the everlasting heritage of your sons and daughters. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, and the author of our salvation, by Christ and with Christ and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Hallelujah, Christ, our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Hallelujah.
reception of the body and blood of Christ. Loving Jesus, my fast from receiving the sacrament of Holy Communion does not arise out of any lack of devotion to you, but out of the love that you have commanded that we have for one another. Since I cannot now receive your sacramentally, I beseech you to unite myself to you spiritually, together with all your faithful people, and that I might embrace you with all the affections of my soul. In this time of trial, never permit me to be separated from you. Amen. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with the spiritual food of Christ's loving presence. Send us now into the world in peace, and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Live without fear. Your Creator has made you holy, has always protected you, and loves you as a mother. Go in peace to follow the good road. And may the blessing of our all loving God, Creator, Christ, and Spirit be upon us and upon you and all you love this day. Serve the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.